know who we are. You know who we are. We are QPR. This video will look back on the career of Terry Venvels and his time as QPR manager. After an excellent spell as a player at Loftus Road, Venables moved to Crystal Palace in 1974, but his playing career didn't last much longer. He moved more into the coaching side and retired from playing at just 31 years of age before becoming manager at Palace in 1976. It was there that he built an exciting young side which won back-to-back -back promotions from the old third division to the top flight. His team was dubbed the team of the 80s, with mostly players from the youth team and much was expected of them. The likes of Kenny Sanson, Terry Fenwick and Clive Allen were all at Palace, along with the experienced head of Jerry Francis. But after struggling in the first division, the opportunity came up to return to QPR as manager. Rangers had gone from almost winning the first division championship in 1976 and close to winning the UEFA Cup in 1977 to being relegated to Division 2 and struggling near the bottom by 1980. It was a hell of a drop and Jim Gregory turned to Venables to bring back the glory days. Speaking in the Loftus Road Legends book, Venables said, I'd been manager at Palace for a few years. We got Palace promoted from the third division to the second division and then won the second division championship. And then we got up to the first division. But we had a bad start to the season and we were struggling a bit. Jim was straight in and he offered Palace £100,000 for me. I remember Palace's chairman, Raymond Bloy, came to me and he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, no, what do you want to do? If you take the money, I'll go. If you don't, I'll stay. I think it was tempting for Palace at the time. And after about 12 games, we were low in the table. So they just took the money. The arrival of a former player with a good reputation as manager should have been a boost to the fans. But many were sceptical. The team of the 80s, of course, crashed and burned quite quickly is probably the best way to put it. And so there was some degree of, I don't think, I think scepticism is probably too strong a word, but a degree of hesitancy um, as to how things would go under Terry. Um, you know, people still had great memories of him as a player, but he, I, I guess a lot of Rangers fans felt he was still a little bit unproven, really, as a manager. I don't think, you know, it was a universal, oh, happy days, Terry is back which a lot of people who um, have been Rangers supporters from a slightly later era might be a bit surprised to hear. There was some degree of hesitancy. His first match in charge was away at Derby County with the big match cameras there to cover it. Andy King scored his first goal for Rangers, but we went 3-1 down as it looked to be a losing start for Venables. One-on-one, -on -one, it's a race now. Here's Epson. It was a sign of things to come, though, as the team rallied with a late comeback. First time anybody's gone through in an FA Cup tie or a League Cup tie. With uh, no goals being scored, but Langley's going to get one here. Well, well, well. That was remarkable. The free kick. And Rangers populate the penalty area. Gillard got the touch, and King gets the goal. It's 3-3. Andy King. Venables was quick to start to put his team together. Many argue about who his first signing was, but striker Simon Stainrod, speaking on the Open All Arts podcast, talked about his move to West 12. If you asked Barry Silkman, Silky would say he was his first signing. <laughs> but Silky would also say he was the best player that he signed and that, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's the greatest footballer that ever lived. Modest but, man. I think we signed the same day. So, uh, yeah, I think I was equal first signing. And and and, the, and by a long way, the much better one. And I met Terry for lunch uh, at the old uh, rail hotel at King's Cross and uh, with, with Archie Warren, Arnie Warren. And um, in half an hour, I learn more about football and like be more motivated and excited to do something 
about playing football than ever I had in, in the whole of my life. Like, you know, and I was a kid who loved playing, like, you know, you know, I lived with a ball. Every, every morning I got a ball out practicing before I did anything. And talking to Terry, I thought, crikey, it's like, it's a different world. It's like, you know, I need to listen to this fella. So that he was the reason that I, signed. I could have signed for Chelsea the same week. And, um, and it was down to, um, it was a choice between um, uh, Jeff Hurst and Terry Venables. So, like, you know, very reputable choices. But Terry's, Terry's conversation was just, like, from another level. And everybody says it. Everyone that's worked with him says the same thing. Uh, he, he was, like, he was the pre-Guardiola Guardiola, but with a bit more football in him and a bit more entertainment and yeah. more intelligence and a, and a much nicer fella. Spainrod had a big impact, but he wasn't the only one of the new arrivals as Venables looked to try and build a new team. He raided his old club palace to bring in John Burridge, Terry Fenwick, Mike Flanagan, Tony Seeley and Jerry Francis, making us not the most popular club amongst Crystal Palace fans. The change, though, was instant as Venables imposed his style on the club with some great attacking football, but a real discipline in the back with his famous offside trap for straight in opposition teams. On the coaching pitch, he was on another level, as Simon Stainrod explains. I've never had a coach that that l had a style of play or um, uh, um, a way of talking to players that could like uh, improve you as an individual. And and from that, uh, it, it was just it was just he's in from another level. There's been, mm -hmm. there's nobody there is nobody who's coaching or coached. At that level, you know, people could talk about Bielsa, Guardiola, Johan Cruyff. I mean, T TV did it at Barcelona. They'd not won a title for 17 years. He went to Barcelona. They won it the first season, play playing the same way we played at QPR. Terry was just so different, but he was so different to everybody. And, and at an early stage, in the early stage of training, I mean, we were just used to showing players down the line and... Um, the, the right back would, would show the left winger down the line and try and stop him crossing the ball. All of a sudden, Terry changed it and said, no, what we're going to do is we're going to show players in, inside. We're going to close up the pitch when we're defending. We're going to mm -hmm. open up the pitch when we're attacking. And then all of a sudden, we started thinking, oh, what's he talking about? But when we started training and working on it, suddenly it, it, it was working and it was, it was marvellous. And it, it was the start of a, a, a new way of playing that none of us would do before, and def certainly not me. After coming in with Rangers struggling, we ended that season in eighth place, which was pretty impressive. And it featured some great wins over the likes of West Ham and Chelsea, as Venables was starting to establish himself as a really exciting manager. The club were not looking to stand still. There were more new signings. John Gregory joined from Brighton and Clive Allen rejoined the club from Crystal Palace. It was an exciting time at QPR and the team were doing really well, pushing for promotion. And we sat around the promotion places for much of that season. But that 1981-82 season was probably best known for the FA Cup run. So back in the days when QPR didn't get knocked out in the third round of the FA Cup, we started that third round with a draw at home to Middlesbrough, meaning a replay up at Ayrson Park. And Simon Stainrod tells the story of him almost missing that replay for injury. We sneaked a draw at home uh, and then uh, went up to Middlesbrough. Uh, and and I'd, I'd not been very well, and Terry like be ringing me at home. Uh, the, the lads had, put, had gone there already, like, and uh, I'd had food poisoning. And um, um, the guy, I think the game was on a Wednesday, and I didn't set off until the Wednesday morning, so I'd not seen the lads and what have you. I can remember getting there feeling terrible. First thing I'd had to eat for like three days was in the hotel when I got into. Uh, um, wherever it was near Middlesbrough, where we were staying. And, you know, I travelled up on the train. I was shattered, like, and, and TV, he just, you know, he came up, like, he said, if you don't fancy it, you don't have to play. I was just went, like, <laughs> <laughs> said, there's no way, no way I've come up all the way on the train, like, not to play. And uh, so he said, do you think, you think you can really play? Are you fit enough? I said, yeah, I think I can. And for me, that was like uh, it was the most one of the most fun games ever because it was like a terrible, incredible atmosphere. Mm. 
like the old Ayrson Park, they're fancying the chances. And we've ended up going there and, and, and I think there was extra time. You know, I scored two in the game and uh and it set us it was on, it was the third round, isn't it? You know, so it's the first game that we play. And to I always remember that, like going out to Wembley thinking about that, that that it had been against the odds and that Terry had the confidence. If I said like you know, I wanted to play he'd bite me. So Rangers ran out three two winners and it was Blackpool in the next round. And another replay after a nil nil draw at Bloomfield Road. It was back to Loftus Road where Clive Allen was not messing about. He scored four goals in a five one win. The fifth round would see us come up against Joe Walters, who had scored twice to deny Venables and QPR the chance of an FA Cup semi final in nineteen seventy four. So there were a few nerves around seeing him and his Grimsby side. But we needn't have worried. Rangers ran out comfortable three one winners and set up a quarter final against of course, Crystal Palace. Now, it was safe to say there was a lot of bad blood between the two sides after Rangers had taken Venables and several players away from Sellers Park. This was an opportunity, though, to reach the semi-final for the first time in our history after twice going out in the quarterfinals when Venables was a player. I mean, that that was um, one of the most memorable games uh, out of the 50 years that I've been going now to Loftus Road regularly. Um, we were confident that we were going to beat Palace because we felt that we were the better team. They weren't a particularly good team. You know, the team of the 80s had just nosedived. And by 81-2, they were struggling. But it was a very tight game. Palace were clearly up for it. Their fans were up for it. By this time, Palace, it is not um, an exaggeration to say, hated us because we had signed so many of their best players, most of them at not exactly bargain transfer fee prices, but certainly not top whack transfer fee prices. And again, we wonder if Palace can hold out. Uh, the Clive Allen goal, with Allen, of course, going out to the Palace fans and gesticulating at the end, which I think he denied, but it was pretty obvious because it was on TV. You then had the police horses on the pitch. Um, the Palace fans all dashed round to Loftus Road and were throwing dustbins around in Loftus, Loftus Road at the Rangers fans. There was a few dust-ups, I think, on Shepherd's Bush the Green. So it, it was a very, very memorable game. Um, and a great atmosphere. And, of course, the fact that we were in our first FA Cup semi-final ever was such a big deal. So Rangers had finally done it, and we'd reached the first ever FA Cup semi-final. And the players seemed pretty happy to be facing West Brom at Highbury. Number three, Rangers. Number two, okay. West Brom at Highbury. Yeah. It was a momentous occasion for the club and Venables made some surprise changes in the build-up to the game, showing the tactical genius that he would later become renowned for. Only two or three days before the actual kick-off, we decided to play with a sweeper system. And great surprise to the players, but um, Terry obviously knew how we wanted to play the game. And on the day, it worked fantastically well. And at that time, West Brom were a very strong side. Uh, I felt as though that Terry, just with that one change, had changed the whole thing in our, our favour. It was a big day for QPR fans and a chance for Terry Venables to lead us to our first ever FA Cup final. Nice ball back to Fennick. Bob Hazel still well forward, well played. And Allen. And Fennick. And now Micklewhite. And Hazel. Second division 
Queen's Park Rangers go to Wembley. Courtesy of a goal in the 72nd minute, Allen got the ricochet off Robertson's clearance to give Rangers a place in the FA Cup final for the first time in their history. It was an excellent West Brom team. I mean, they were gutted because they'd also lost the League Cup semi-final that season as well. So, you know, and people never remember the semi-finalists. Obviously, they'll remember the finalists, but not beaten semi-finalists. Um, and it was a good team. Um, obviously, Bob Hazel had a fantastic game. Mark Cyril Regis out of the match. Um, you know, the whole Rangers team played very, very well. Um, you know, it was, it was just a, a great day, a big Rangers support, probably just as big a West Brom support. They had tons and tons of fans at the clock end. Um, but we did it. You know, and, and the fact that we won with the goal off uh, Clive Allen's knee at the North Bank, where all the Rangers fans were, was the absolute icing on the cake. So uh, a fantastic day, uh, another very, very memorable day. Um, I must admit, uh, Lump come in my throat when the ball went in. And then, of course, it was a long 15, 20 minutes or whatever it was to the end of the game. And, of course, it's very emotional. We've got quite a few sort of young boys there and they're all very upset and uh, in, a, in a good way, you know, and just emotionally full up, you know. It's, what is, it's a wonderful moment for us. What, as far as you were concerned, was the tactical key to the match? <clears throat> well, we, we did play different and we wanted to keep the ball away from them and uh, try and run them out. Um, I've seen them a couple of times and we've picked up a few things and they're a good side, you know, and we, we had to make sure that they didn't catch us on the break. And Tony Curry was going off and into the back and our full-backs were breaking. I felt they had a, a problem trying to stop our full-backs. Tony, Tony or Glenn Roder were putting our full-backs in and we were starting our build-ups mainly from wide positions. And I thought that um, we did it very well and I was very pleased. That was true on the goal, wasn't it, in that it stemmed from uh, Terry Fennick on the right? That's right. Uh, uh, most of our build-ups actually, I mean, it started from Tony Curry, but we, we were going to try and get it wide and then start from there. And um, we kept the ball, we wanted to be patient and we were saying we haven't got to win the game in the first five minutes. Let's take our time and uh, not be pushed because it's so um, easy for a team like us that uh, we were underrated and we were four to one against, which upset me in the first place. I thought that was a disgrace. The bookmakers put us at four to one, and um, that was a quite a good spur actually because I think that upset everyone. So Venables had done it. QPR were in the FA Cup final. The excitement of it all did really affect the league form though, and Rangers dropped a few points in the running meaning we missed out on promotion to the top flight by just three points, finishing in fifth place. It was all about that FA Cup final, though. The FA Cup final was a thrill to me beyond because we, we never, as a second division side, we never felt we were going to be in the Cup final at that time. We felt we'd still have to improve, get into the first division, be a, a team of that quality before you could have got there. But we did it before our time. Up goes Price, that was Gregory this time with a much further header and Simon Stainrod with a chance maybe to move away for Rangers. Oh, good tackle by Hoddle on Waddock. Roberts. Hoddle. Hoddle! It's there! It's there! He won it with the tackle and he scored the goal! Glenn Hoddle, the pride of Tottenham! has sent the fans delirious again. Stainrod with the long throw for Queen's Park Rangers. Roberts, it was Hazel's flick, and Fennick was in there, and it's a goal! Terry Fennick. The set-piece ploy works again. Fennick is the scorer. Five minutes left, and it's Rangers' turn to celebrate. And the long throw works again. Simon Stainrod took it. Watch for the flick on by Bob Hazel, number five. Watch Terry Fennick come in at the far post. And the header over Ray Clement's head. It's 1-1. A replay for only the third time in Wembley history and the second time in consecutive years now seems certain. And the whistle confirms the fact. Terry Fennick from the North East saves the Cockney Cup final for Queen's Park Rangers. Fennick shows his delight. The first fullback ever to score from Oakham Clay in a Wembley final. And 
what a priceless goal for the second division side. A replay next Thursday here at Wembley. Well, we've got uh, Terry Venables now with us. Terry, if you'd like to sort of come through. And we can bring in a couple of the Tottenham lads as well. Garth Crooks, Tony Galvin and uh, Ray Clements. Terry, first of all, don't go, don't go, uh, Terry Funnick, for a moment. Did you think it was gone when Glenn Huddle scored? Well, obviously, the time slipping away, you think it would have been, but I thought it was a bit unfortunate. I think Gary Woodup would have got the ball. I think the referee got in his way, didn't he? Just prior to the goal. And it got a reflection, <coughs> as we've just seen, off, uh, off Tony Curry. Did it? It did, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, well, the way it was going, that's the, way, the only way Peter Ucker <laughs> was going to get beaten. I mean, yeah. he'd he done very well. Marvellous performance yes, by him. Yes, yes. But um, there we are. We live to fight another day. Yes. After that hard-fought draw, the replay was a game where Rangers showed the world what a good side they could be. Stainrod. Roberts. Like a battleship charging through there. Oh, and he's going all the way. Roberts is brought down and it has to be a penalty. No doubt. Roberts went through, and although Rangers are complaining, never the slightest doubt. And it's Tony Curry, the skipper, who brings him down, and Glenn Hoddle, who puts the ball on the spot. Well, Hoddle has scored 14 times this season, five of them from the penalty spot, and he's put Spurs into the lead. Six minutes gone, Hoddle the penalty, Spurs 1-0. Still that little conference going on. And Curry and Gregory dreaming up something. Flanagan's in there too. It's Flanagan who hits it, but hits it straight at the wall. A little chip coming in there. Stainrod hoping to make something of it. And Nipper White! Outside. No, it's disallowed. The Rangers fans don't realise it yet, but it will be disallowed. An offside, presumably against Stainrod. It was bad luck because it was a magnificent uh, little chip. Stainrod going through there. Now it's Curry. Played nicely there for Mickle White. Looking to get round Hewton, looking to get over Galvin, and Stainrod is in there! Good goalkeeping, that, Brian. Momentarily, that was going to be an open goal. It's Curry for Rangers. And the linesman thought about putting his flag up and put it down again. Stainrod just onside in that case, then. Flanagan's underneath this one, Clemens has got it and lost it. Gregor is turning it back again, and Miller in all sorts of trouble there until it was Perriman who put it behind for the corner. Mike Flanagan with the corner for Queen's Park Rangers, and five of them lined up again outside the penalty area as we saw so often in the uh, game on Saturday. Fennick getting in there, and an offside against Hazel, and they're uh, surrounding the referee who say that the Rangers player saying that Hazel was chopped down in the box and it should have been a penalty. Clive White said no, he got no support, at least Rangers got no support from the linesman and the game goes on. But Rangers clearly feeling there that Hazel had been brought down illegally inside the box. Curry. Time it was Gregory they found, Stainrod holding off Price, but not uh, Miller's challenge. Perryman taking up the ball now and finding Archibald. He's got Hazard in there as well, and Crooks is here too. And Rangers were there in strength as well as Fennick now takes it away. Gregory, Stainrod in a lot of space on this left hand side, and a nice ball there from Gregory that found him. Waddock's up there, Flanagan's up there. And, well, Clements again called into action by Stainrod. You can see them on the right of the picture there, lining up now to launch themselves at this Tully Curry corner. Gregory didn't get there, Waddock with a shot, saved well by Clements. Flanagan turning it back, 
And in the end, it was Miller who got it away. That'll fall for Roberts, and now for Archibald. Hasn't got a lot of support. And Hazel and Warwick between them. Getting it away for Rangers. Micklewhite trying to turn it on for Flanagan and trying to get it back into the path of Tony Curry. Curry battling around there in that midfield area, trying to get Rangers on the move again. And it's Stainrod now. A long ball on the far side. Gregory's there, played in once more against the crossbar. How desperately unlucky there for Rangers. They've certainly frightened Tottenham in this second half. And John Gregory, who was doubtful for this game until late this afternoon, Stainrod hit a magnificent ball there to find him on the far side and he played it first time a tantalizing ball there that had the beating of Clements and hit the bar and it produced the corner and Brooke happy to bang it away for Tottenham Neil oh the flag stayed down Curry is onside He's got Gregory up now, and he's got Stainrod up. This could be trouble for Spurs. Played in there towards Hazel, and he very nearly made it. And no wonder Ray Clements is delighted with the defending there of Paul Miller. They've won it for the second successive year. Spurs by a goal to nil, scored by Glenn Hoddle, the penalty. And they've been so close together all night, why not swap shirts in the end? They've almost been in the same shirt all night. What a and Hollow, and a nice touch there from the Rangers captain Tony Curry and a good bit of sportsmanship at the end by two fierce competitors but Spurs have won it and so go into the European Cup Winners Cup next season but the choker really was the replay because we were the better team you know, I remember, I think John Gregory hit the crossbar, Gary Micklewhite had a goal disallowed. You know, we played lovely football. Spurs were tired. You know, they'd played a lot of games that season. We went back home to High Wycombe on the train and you would have thought that Spurs had lost. The Spurs fans were very quiet, um, didn't make very noise, much noise at all. The Rangers fans were very, very proud of the performance, delighted with what had been achieved um, and confident that we were going to have a very, very good season the next year, which, of course, we did. But it's a it's a little bit of a bittersweet memory, really, David. You know, we played very well in that replay. We were the better team. Um, unfortunately, we lost and that's football. Uh, but it's it's obviously an evening that I will never forget. Venables did not let the disappointment of that cup final defeat roll into the following season. Although we lost the opening day game against Newcastle, we never really looked back after that. The team was full of goals. We scored four goals or more on seven occasions that season. A well-organised team, but full of exciting attacking players, and we stormed towards the title. Despite dropping down to second over the Christmas period, promotion never really looked in doubt even that early in the season. The second half of that season saw some memorable wins, including a 6-1 win over Middlesbrough, and promotion was sealed with the win over Leeds United on St George's Day. Rangers were confirmed as champions with a 3-1 home win over Fulham. Venables had done an incredible job, just two full seasons in, and we'd reached an FA Cup final and won promotion to the top flight, but only a third time in our history. He was not going to stop there either, and plans were announced for Venables to achieve his dream of buying the club and become both club owner and manager. Uh, I have been here now 18 years. A lot of regret, uh, a lot of emotion. Times to come, uh, the club's in a very good position. I will be standing down as chairman at the end of the season. Terry, uh, we've come to an arrangement if he can get a consultant together, he will be taking over the football. Yeah, well, it's one where Jim's very determined to do what he's going to do. Well, I've, we've spoken about it many times, and um, I try to do everything I can to make him change his mind, but he's made up his mind. So therefore, that um, if someone else is going to take over the football side, I think it might just as well that it's me. Um, and my ambition, he's a very wise man. I've learned a lot in two and a half years, and I would say if I could aim my ambition was to be 50% as good as what he's done and as good as he is, I would be thrilled. 
As the team returned for pre-season, Venables made it clear we were not going to the first division just to make up the numbers. And I remember going in for pre-season training and Terry bringing us all together and saying to us, right, he said, I've looked at this league and I'm telling you now, we can win this. <laughs> and like we sort of look at one another, he said, there's no one here better than us, we can win this. And all of a sudden, we sort of think to yourself, oh, well, if he thinks we can win it, yeah. we've we, we got a chance. I remember Terry saying that if, if you if you aim for the sun and just reach the moon, you ain't done too bad. Mm, mm. And, and that was sort of his outlook, I think. Venables was proved right, and there was no limit to where this QPR side could go. It took a few games for us to find our feet, but we were soon winning games and winning them well. Five wins in a row in September, including a 4-0 hammering up at Wolves. Relegation was never an issue, and the team took the division by storm. We moved up to fourth place with a 6-0 hammering of Stoke City in January, before a win at Arsenal saw Venables linked with the manager's job at Highbury. The second highest finish in the club's history looked on, but a final day defeat at Everton saw us drop down to fifth place. Just seven points, though, behind champions Liverpool, and the top five finish meant we qualified for the UEFA Cup. QPR fans rightly believed that we had a chance to build on this, challenge for the title and compete in Europe. Fans went away to enjoy their summer as the season ended, not knowing what was going on behind the scenes. It was soon all to change. Speaking to the QPR official magazine in 2010, Venables gave his side of the story. Jim and I had a difference of opinion. My contract was up at the end of the 1983-84 season and he wouldn't agree to much of an improved deal. I was on 30 grand a year at the time, in three full seasons with the club, which had included avoiding relegation, an FA Cup final and promotion to the top flight. I hadn't received a rise. What do you want then, Jim asked me. It was before the time of aging, so it was difficult. 50 grand was my response. I'll offer you 35, he says. He's playing hardball with me. I just couldn't believe it. And after all I'd achieved, he's offering me that. The bastard. Negotiations went on. And then he says to me, right, I'll offer you 40,000, but I'm not budging. Neither am I, I said. I want 50,000. So we reached the standoff. The season continues and things are still going well on the pitch. Then out of the blue, I get a call from Barcelona, inviting me for an interview for the manager's job. I go back to see Jim. Have you changed your mind? I asked. No, he says. And he is adamant. That's it. Not a penny more. All right, then. I'll go at the end of the season, I said to him. Hey, on, says Jim. What do you want to do that for? I think it's going really well. Why do you want to leave? Because we can't agree, I say. I'm not staying for that. And knowing Jim, he would have wanted me to sign a four-year contract on that wage as well. As a matter of fact, I added, I've received an offer from Barcelona. Jim started laughing, and I mean laughing, belly laughing. He thinks I'm trying it on. But you only had to say good morning to Jim, and he'd look out the window to check. That's how he was. Barcelona, he asked. You're going to Barcelona? Well, I've been invited for an interview by him. I don't know how this has come about either, but I'm one of three candidates that they're interested in. But I don't want to go. Oh, you have to go, Jim says. He still thinks it's a wind-up, and I'm using it to get the deal. So he decides to call my bluff. Oh, you better go if it's Barcelona, he added. All right, I will, was my response. So I went over to Barcelona for my interview, and they liked what he had to say. I couldn't really speak Spanish, so I was given an interpreter. To be honest, I'm convinced the interpreter did his bit to get me the job. I'm sure he was adding to my answers, telling them what he knew they wanted to hear. They'd ask me something like, would you like to come to Barcelona? And I'd say, yeah, sounds great. And the interpreter would give them a 10-minute answer. I'm thinking, where's all that come from? They offered me the job, which was unbelievable. Anyway, I head back to England and I go and see Jim. I meet him in his office, him sitting in his raised chair. So how'd you get on in Spain then, he asks, still clearly thinking I've never been for an interview. Very well, I replied, but I still want to stay. What are you going to offer me? £40,000, he says. Unbelievable. He hadn't budged. Fine, Jim, I say. Well, Barcelona have offered me the job, so I'm going to take it. Of course they have, Jim says sarcastically. And then he's laughing at me again. 
if they've offered you the job, like you say, you better go. So that was it, the end of the meeting. I got up, I went downstairs, and I headed for the door. As I'm walking past Jim's receptionist, she's on the phone. Mr. Venable, she says, Mr. Gregory has asked if you'll tell him to fuck off, I replied, and I kept walking. That was that. I was off to Barcelona. Venables and Gregory, of course, made up. Venables said, the next time I heard from Jim, we were 12 games into the new season and my Barcelona team were top of La Liga. He came out to visit me and I'll never forget this. He says, listen, you should just come back. They don't take football seriously out here. Come back to QPR. So a real sliding doors moment. Where would the club have been if they had offered him that extra 10 grand a year? Could we have gone on to win the league? Well, Venable certainly thought so. He said, yeah, I honestly believe we could have done it. Of course, it's easy for me to say that now, but I really mean it. The team was so good. We definitely had the players to do it. In that first season in the top flight, we qualified for Europe. So we were really pushing on, but it wasn't meant to be. These things happen in football. But I would like to thank the QPR fans for being so supportive during the time I was there. I've never really had a chance to say how grateful I am to them for that. Benables, of course, went on to have great success at Barcelona. He won the Liga in his first season and reached the Champions League final. He returned to England and then he won the FA Cup with Spurs before doing an absolutely brilliant job with England. Whilst QPR fans often hoped that one day he would make a return to Loftus Road. Sadly, that was never the case. But in his time at QPR, he couldn't have done much more. He managed QPR 179 times and won 89 games in that period. That's a win percentage of 49.72%. Only William Birrell has a higher win percentage in the club's entire history. And only really Alex Stock and Dave Sexton come anywhere near close to that amazing record. Simon Stainrod was his main man. He scored 54 goals during Venable's time at the club. Clive Allen scored 47 under Venables and John Gregory got 37. He's arguably one of our greatest ever managers. For me, he is the best in my lifetime. But he was so much more than just a manager or a footballer. A great character with a real sense of humour and someone the fans absolutely loved. He goes down as one of the all-time greats at Loftus Road and a man who will never be forgotten. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give us a like and subscribe to the channel. There must be lights burning brighter somewhere Not to be birds flying high Sky more blue if I can dream of a better land where well, all my brothers walk hand in hand. Tell me why, oh, why, oh, why can't my dream come true? Oh, why there must be peace and understanding. Sometime strong winds of promise that will blow away the doubt and fear. If I can dream of a warmer sun where hopes keep shining on everyone, tell me why. Still I am 
sure that the answer is gonna come somehow. 